I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. Each California Channel Island has its own heartbeat. Each island has its own dynamic, its own size, its own orientation, its own very intimate personal history. Well, this is the final frontier of, of our continent, at any rate. Well, there's eight islands off the coast of California. The four northerly ones are kind of in a line just off of Santa Barbara here. The southern four islands are more widely scattered but to just say that they're a group of islands is to completely misrepresent what they are. They are the trace of a vanished world. I do this interview with a little hesitation and I'm a little nervous about what we're doing here. If you love this island, for God's sakes, don't come here. Some days the islands look as though you can touch them. They're so close but unpredictable weather out here can change that, and it has caused many people to lose their vessels, lose their lives in some cases. The oceans around the islands are unlike the mainland ocean. They're remote, they're hard to access. I kind of think of our California Channel Islands as our North American equivalent of the Galapagos. I coined this phrase, and I say it today. Hi, this is Channel Islands National Park. This is the greatest national park in America. And that's what it is. I've been living here for 22 years, within sight of the islands. Although I've written many books in this house, I often wondered what goes on out there. <laughs> ah, what does it all mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's the history of our species, you know. We're, we're studying human behavior at different time periods and the different challenges that human beings faced in the past. When people look across the horizon and see the Channel Islands, they are nothing other than a silhouette out on the ocean. But once one has stepped on just one island, you can never look at the island with the same eyes again. I would love to be able to tell a story fully in my language, but unfortunately, my great-grandfather told my father, why do you need to learn the language? There's nobody left. Who are you going to talk to? So I start with Sahipaka, once upon a time. Most days, the Channel Islands sit in plain view of millions of people along the California coast. Hardly anyone can tell you their names, let alone what the natives called them long before. By the mid-1800s, all the native peoples were gone from California's Channel Islands, victims of new world expansion and disease. In their place came adventurers and entrepreneurs and larger-than-life characters who had one thing in common. They didn't stop when the West did. They brought their animals and planted their vines and made a life any way they could. And they would change the Channel Islands forever. The opening chapter of my book is riding out in the morning in the dark and riding up the Spurs Mountain on our way out to wherever we're going to gather cattle. We'd be bundled up, it'd be blown and howling. All you would see was the glow of cigarettes and sparks flying off the horse's hooves because we were climbing up in some volcanic ground and being tucked in almost in your own world in a big jacket, trying to stay warm and stay on your horse and not even talking much, maybe talking about the Dodger game. That image of climbing that mountain in the dark, sparks flying, I wish I could make the picture for somebody. You 
know, I'm the fourth generation out here. I long for those old days and I really miss them because they were quite special. I mean, you can imagine not many people were allowed to grow up as I was on an island ranch and having to operate it as it had been for the last hundred years. And it built quite a bit of fortitude and it built quite a bit of sense of self-esteem and, and we're tied to this land. We didn't want to go out of the cattle business. And so for me, I can't say I'm at peace with it. This really starts with my great-grandfather, Walter Vale. He was a young man in his early 20s from the East Coast, a Yankee, and came out west to find his fortune. And in 1870, started in Sonoyta, California and started a ranch. Like many of those ranchers in the 1890s, they started to push west to find other lands to graze their cattle. Walter, along with his a partner and another rancher local to him in Arizona, J.V. Vickers, formed a partnership to purchase this island. The operation became known as Vale and Vickers on Santa Rosa Island. What was nice about it for me was the generational knowledge that just kept coming down the pipeline to me. So that's how this ranch came to be. There was a lot of knowledge and a lot of stories and a lot of culture to this place that uh, I was a recipient of. As young kids, we spent much of the summer here terrorizing the workers here and getting in their way, which we enjoyed. This is the stable area where all the cowhands kept their saddles and bridles, and this was the first job I had. It was making sure this was swept out every morning before the hands even arrived. Can we stand around here so we can get a good look at this house? We sure can. Because this house looks like it may have been here for a while. Been here for a long time. She's built a uh... Uh, sometime in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. You're talking about 1860s? 18, right. So it's uh, well over 100 years old. Yeah. Well, I happened to be working in a regional office in downtown Omaha, Nebraska in early 1974. I got this call from the regional director and he offered me the superintendency of Channel Islands National Monument. And I said, where is that? And they said, well, it's off the coast of Southern California out of Santa Barbara. And so I came out here and the first weekend I was here, I got in a boat and went out and I looked at Anna Cap and I thought, wow, what a magnificent place this is. And then I started reading and finding out that, hey, there was a talk about a national park back as early as the 1930s. And wow, maybe there's a chance someday to do something like this. I met the Vales and they were the most honest person you ever met and a handshake to them meant everything. You had to build their trust, and it took a lot of time uh, being with them and proving to them that I was an honest person too, and you know, build a friendship. I kept asking, you know, and saying, hey, you know, think, think I could come out and go on one of these roundups sometime? And well, let's wait a little while, you know, and a couple of years went by. It was like 1978, as I recall, and, so I came out here all excited and stuff, and I didn't have a saddle at that time until I got this one right here. I came out and started on the first ride, and we started gathering cattle. That day started at 3 in the morning for the poor guy that had to go out into the house pasture and run in the working horses. And it would be real windy in the morning and dark and cold. You'd get on that horse at the barn there, and you'd start trotting. I mean, you would trot halfway across this island, and then you'd ride down these canyons and gather what cattle they are, and you'd funnel them in to China Camp here. They used to have a ranch foreman here named Bill Wallace. His nephew worked as one of the cowboys out here. They had made a ride to China Camp, carried a small pistol with him, and he put it in his back pocket, climbed on the horse, shot himself right through the rear end, and had to ride 14 miles back horseback at, at night, and they find the bullet that was in his boot. It went right down and into his boot. But you gotta be tough. Double tough. If you want to ride 14 miles after shooting yourself in the rear end with a, with a 22. Yeah, there was, there was lots of good times, I mean, uh, you know. These vaqueros in my time period had transitioned to mostly coming out of the high Sonoran Mexican desert. Their work ethic was incredible. Most of them are here for most of their lives. They, they were very loyal. Uh, my father started working for the Vale family in the early 40s. Then they asked him if he would want to come to an island. He didn't know anything about it. He said, sure. 
and they brought him out to Santa Rosa Island. Pretty quickly, he became the foreman. Once he got married in the late 50s, he brought my mom out here. This is the house that I grew up in, so most of my memories are of this place and of this view. On a day like today, my mom would call it, there's popcorn on the water. But to answer your question, I did not start knowing I want to work out for the Park Service. I never thought about being a ranger at all. This is the lead way up to the pier where we would run our cattle and the, it was a job we all competed for as, as kids on horses. We'd have to load these cattle on the boat and they did not want to run down this pier. So we'd open the gates and actually stampede them down the pier into the funnel chutes there and down into the Vaquero. They had a boat called the Vaquero. They were built specifically to haul cattle. The one I'm familiar with was the Vaquero II. It's only five and a half hours before we need it. Yeah, you're doing a pretty good job, Bill. We'd run from 3,000 to 7,000 head of cattle here a year. And the pier wasn't as nice as this one is then. It was a wood pier that we just continually you know, repaired and rebuilt. It was, it was good, but in the winter storms here, sometimes they'd come in, the waves would come in over this pier, it, over the end of it. My forefathers learned very quickly not to nail down the planks, just let the waves bring them and toss them on the beach, because otherwise they would have pulled the pilings out. And then we'd go and collect them off the beach and rebuild the pier again. And it was a vital part of not just moving the cattle, but moving supplies off of this island. The vaquero came with the mail and supplies once every couple of weeks, which was a big day for us. It's kind of a life to itself. It's more or less your own world. It's about the only place left that is the Old West. Why do you think that is? Well, because it has, it's not overrun with people. There's not motorcycles, automobiles, and whatnot running all over, and we do everything on horseback just like we did years ago. And uh, be nice to uh, continue this, but as uh, modern times come, it's, it's on its way out. Fifty weeks of the year, your world may look something like this. You want to be careful before you visit the national parks. Some of them can be dangerous. Because when you get home, you may see your environment differently. Just a little experience with this kind of world makes it harder to tolerate one that looks like this. You know, creating a national park, it just doesn't happen like magic. There were repeated calls to bring the islands into the, a Channel Island park. And there had been bills before when I was very young that had been brought up and failed. And so I went and I talked to our local congressman, Bob Lager Messino, and I said, you know, if you don't introduce a bill to Channel Islands National Park, somebody else is going to do it, and it's in your district, and you know the players. And it didn't take much to talk him into it. And I remember Bill Ehorn was a wonderful guy to work for. He, he had a vision. They kind of had the feeling that they knew that this was going to probably happen, but they had concerns about how they would be treated and their way of life. They all kind of got together and hammered this out that eventually the cattle business would would go on for a while. They did ultimately, as willing sellers, sell to the National Park Service to preserve this great place for future generations. In 1980, Santa Rosa and four other islands were declared a national park. The age of individual ownership and direct decision fades, replaced by well-meaning but complex public management. When Congress set up the National Park Service 100 years ago, they said your job is to conserve the scenery, the wildlife, the historic objects therein, but for the enjoyment of future generations in an unimpaired condition. That's very important to understand. On a spring day during a Cousteau expedition, the Park Service takes control of the island. I think it's a test case. If we cannot manage those islands, I don't see how we're going to manage the world. I agree. When the Park Service bought the island in 1987, to tell you the truth, our whole family actually hated the Park Service because they were coming in and taking this place and we knew it was going to change. And so we began to allow some visitor use out here. We had 
interpretive rangers meeting the visitors at the dock, we're walking them over to the campground, explaining a little bit about the history, explaining a little bit about the natural history of the island, and then we would uh, set the visitors to areas that would not interfere with the ranching family. The more people I got to know with the Park Service and understand the mission, the more I realized that was more in line with what I wanted to see done. And then I understood that it was really actually a really good thing for the Park Service to have the island because it was going to protect it and keep it as open space so that people could come out here. The cattle, of course, when the grass dries up and everything, they're going to get down in these riparian habitats and they cause an impact. And these visitors came out here and they got back to the mainland and they said, you know, this is a national park and this shouldn't happen. The lawsuit sued the National Park Service for allowing these cattle and grazing activities to continue on the island. Russ and Al, my father and uncle and myself, we actually went to Washington, D.C. to fight it, to let this continue as a cattle ranch. And out of that case hearing was a settlement agreement, which it was agreed upon by Vail and Vickers, we'll remove the cattle and the horses, but we'd like to keep the hunting operation. And that's when I started work here. And that was a very interesting challenge for me because with the last roundup it was the end of a way of life. These are uh, saddles that some of them could be a hundred years old. And in general I was kind of the man in the middle between park management and the Vale's presence and operation. It's a real shame that these buildings are all coming apart because nobody lives here anymore. For me, working out here is just, it's just wonderful. It, it's uh, its a, a lift to the spirit and always a lot of fun. I like to share that with the public and talking about the uniqueness of Santa Rosa Island in terms of its uh, natural history and cultural history. Well, I mean, that's kind of part of the big problem for me is that cultural resources aren't respected. and all the ranching and all the human history that went on here in, in you know, our generations, it almost feels like uh, they'd wish that would go away. So when we look at the Vale Ranch on Santa Rosa Island, we see those buildings, they're historic structures, we want to maintain those to tell part of that ranching story, but we could adaptively reuse those buildings to meet either a research purpose or a public purpose of overnight accommodations. You know, got so many resources out here, the plants and the animals, and especially around the beaches, the pennipid populations have exploded around here. I just yesterday saw a banding of a bald eagle. I, in all my years out here, I'd never seen a bald eagle out here. They want to preserve the island as it was before, and the, the ranching history in the last several hundred years, they're not as interested in maintaining, and that's hard to watch. The ranch was allowed to leave the last of the horses that they didn't think could make the crossing. Everybody had their favorites. There was one that I grew up with, her name was Sadie. The one named Matilda that a lot of the kids learned to ride on. She was really gentle and she's close to 40 years old. The horses absolutely represent the last vestige of the ranch. The transition of the islands that were privately owned takes time. The most important piece is, will people enjoy their experience and will they walk away from Channel Islands saying, I learned something, but more importantly, will they walk away and say, I really am glad that this is a national park. Well, Tim Vale was the last of the Vales to depart Santa Rosa Island and it was a very emotional day for all of us. He had a hard time leaving himself, probably more than any of the other family members. We were sitting on the tailgate quarter mile up the road and we weren't talking a lot but just it was a bit of a teary farewell and a bit of a teary conversation it was tough we all were there to see him off at the airstrip and there were tears you know we really respected uh, the emotions of the moment because uh, his his family uh, for most of the 20th century loved this island and took care of it in, in the best way they could.
Channel Islands lie in one of the most hazardous shipping channels in the world. Some days the islands look as though you can touch them. They're so close. The weather is so clear. The ocean is so flat and calm as a lake. But unpredictable weather out here can change that. And it has caused many people to lose their vessels, lose their lives in some cases. So you have roiling water, you have a lot of fog, and you have a lot of wind. None of that is good for a sailor. There's many uncharted reefs out there. Currents are very strong, especially when they approach the islands. If you were to include all eight islands, there's probably over 500 shipwrecks. Uh, any number of ships are at the bottom of that channel are because of the winds. And a lot of the people coming down the coast will cut in between the Channel Islands and the mainland to save time, and that's dangerous. They shouldn't do that. I left Aurora, Illinois with 150 head of beef cattle, which we intended to drive to the gold miners in California. After disposing of my share in the venture, I decided to return home by steamer. I took passage on the Winfield Scott on December 2nd. The Winfield Scott was a beautiful steamer ship. That vessel was fairly famous because it had a big shipment of gold bullion. This was a very fast boat. Uh, in fact, it had set a speed record for rounding Cape Horn. And it was really important for the coastal steamers competing during the gold rush to have bragging rights of who arrived at Panama, who arrived at San Francisco first. I took a berth in the steerage with about 400 others, principally miners returning east. Everything went along all right until the afternoon of the 3rd when a heavy fog set in, so heavy you could almost cut it with a knife. And the captain, uh, Blunt, decided that he would cut the gap between Santa Cruz and Anacapa Islands and then make his way down south. And one of the passengers was near the wheelhouse that evening and heard one of the officers ask, Captain, the weather is dirty and squally. Shall we keep her out? The captain answered, No, let her rip. It's 11 o'clock at night, and it was chaos. It was suddenly awakened from a sound sleep by a terrible jar. There were waves breaking, confusion, bone crunching sound of that metal hitting rock, and it plows into middle Anacapa Island. Bodies flying, hurling across the decks of the ship. You wake up, now you're on your side. You don't see anything, it's pitch black out there. Tumbling out of my berth, I was confronted by the horror-stricken visage of my toothless and bald-headed stateroom companion, who had no time to secure his wig and false teeth. So the water in December could be the low 50s, so that would have been a shock. They had pretty good swell action, washing them to shore. The island itself, if you look at it here, it's kind of a fortress. There's no place you can really land or get up onto. But in the dark, they found this one rock that looked like it would do. They managed to get everybody on there and then realized that they weren't on the island itself, but on a rock offshore. When I started exploring shipwrecks in the early 80s, I was fascinated by the experience of going back in history and seeing these, but I wanted to know more about them. I wanted to find out what caused the wrecking event. Were any lives lost? Here in the Northern Channel Islands, which make up the uh, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and the National Park, there's over 300 shipwrecks that we've uh, recorded over time since 1980. We have sailing vessels, we have Chumash artifacts, and we have vessels like the Grumman Avenger aircraft from World War II. And we have a Japanese destroyer right off Destroyer Rock. We have a sidewheel steamer, Yankee Blade, right there in the same location. You can literally swim from a sidewheel steamer to a Clemson-class destroyer. And it was a domino effect that led to the Honda disaster, which is known as the largest naval disaster in U.S. history during peacetime. We've identified over 150 historic losses in sanctuary and park waters. And we've located just over 30 of those sites. So we have our work cut out for us. Shipwrecks are mysterious. They hold secrets. When we dive on a site like the Winfield Scott, we are traveling back in time to December 2nd, 1853. We had just reached the bottom of the provisions and had been living on less than half rations for seven days, with no shelter from the approaching storm. The passengers were put in lifeboats, and they found a place called Frenchy's Cove. It's not a very large beach, but this is where 500 people made their home for eight days. Robbery and plunder has been the order of the day since the wreck. But today, we've appointed a committee of investigation and have had everything searched. 
a good deal of property has come to light, and two thieves have been flogged. Right behind me here is the final resting place of the Winfield Scott. That's the only shipwreck so far that's on the National Register of Historic Places. The Sidewell steamer, the California, was northbound from Panama, saw the distress signals, saw the shipwreck, wrecked at Anacapa, and came to Frenchy's Cove. Their manifest was full. They could not take on the passengers from the Winfield Scott, but in due course, they did take the gold bullion. Today, it lies in about 25 to 30 feet of water. You can snorkel there, you can dive there, you can see part of the paddle wheel, you can see a good section of the deck with the through deck spikes. Many of these shipwrecks, the grandchildren or great-grandchildren of the people that perhaps died aboard that vessel or maybe were saved in a dramatic life-saving, to be able to tell these descendants where that boat ended up and what happened, that really can provide closure for them to know what their ancestors went through. As the uh, captain of the California Promise, he came back in eight days. When asked by hungry ones about provisions, the captain of the California's reply sent a thrill of joy through the crowd. I'm loaded down with everything from a biscuit to an ox. What's great about this story is that everybody survives. Every single passenger walks away with their life and the stories to tell. The part that's the most exciting about diving here is, is the, the antiquity of it and, and that after over 150 years, there's still wood down there on the seafloor from the, the Winfield Scott that you can reach out and you can touch something that's been down there ever since the gold rush. You know, that, that to me is just, just so vivid, you know, to be able to reach down and touch the past. lined up to swim 22 miles in William Wrigley Jr.'s highly anticipated ocean marathon. Stripping naked and covering themselves with lard, men, women, and even the legless mad dog Russians have entered the chilly winter water to take a shot at crossing the channel first. It generated a ton of publicity. It had a lot of people saying they're swimming to where, which of course was the point. Catlain is quite an interesting destination to considering how close we are to Southern California. William Wrigley Jr. is the gentleman who purchased this island in 1919, and he's the one that really got the island going. William Wrigley to me was a genius. He was Disney before Disney was. He invented the all-inclusive vacation. He owned the island, he owned the shipping line, he owned the hotels, he owned the restaurants. It just made Avalon an amazing place. People really wanted to come to Catalina and enjoy themselves. It was magic. Of the eight channel islands off the coast of Southern California, only Santa Catalina is developed for recreation. And this is restricted to a single square mile, the city of Avalon. Welcome to Catalina. I'm with the Chamber of Commerce. If you have any questions or needs. Chuck was born here and is quite proud of it. And he's become the official greeter and the town historian. The town was called Tim's Landing when George Chateau purchased the island. And then they changed the name and started calling it Chateau Town. Luckily for all of us, his sister-in-law had been reading a poem by Lord Tennyson. Edda went to her brother in law and said, George, how do you like the name Avalon? He said, it certainly sounds a lot better than Chateau Town. George Chateau had the vision, but he didn't have the money. So the three Banning brothers took over the island in 1891. They were the ones that were bringing all the passengers over here and their boats. So they felt, why don't we just own it? Now, the Banning brothers had a lot of good ideas for this island. The only trouble is they had stipulations that the people of Avalon didn't like. They didn't want any alcohol to be served in this town. I mean, let's face it, part of fishing is drinking. To come over to the island and not being able to drink is almost a, a sacrilege to, to fishermen. Now, fishing became a big industry over here. In fact, we still have the Tuna Club. We were founded in 18... 98 by Charles Frederick Holder. He wanted to give the fish a sporting chance. That's where the term sports fishing came. We're the birthplace of big game angling and big game blue water conservation. 
The old story is there was a gentleman who wanted to collect the insurance on his hotel. He also wanted to collect the insurance on his mother-in-law. And so he locked the mother-in-law up in the attic, set the hotel on fire, and left the town. Well, they luckily got the mother-in-law out in time, and within a matter of a couple of hours, the whole west end of Avalon had been destroyed. Well, the Bannies went bankrupt, and so they were obviously looking for another speculator. Well, they just happened to find out that William Wrigley Jr. had just purchased a home in Pasadena. He came from Philadelphia with no money. I, th well, I think he had $16. He moved to Chicago and was selling soap. He was a traveling salesman, and from there, eventually started the gum company. They sent Charles Sumner to talk to Mr. Wrigley and said, how would you like to buy an island? He seemed to feed off of his own energy. The more gum he sold, the more gum he wanted to sell, and the more things he wanted to do, and he kept coming up with ever more creative ideas to promote it. So in 1919, sight unseen, Mr. Wrigley purchased the entire stock of the Santa Catalina Island Company and ended up with this island. He and great-grandmother, Ada, came out to Catalina and were just captivated by how beautiful it was. And in fact, there's a quote. The sun was just coming up and I had never seen a more beautiful spot. Right then and there, I determined that the island should never pass out of my hands. And I'm the fourth generation to be involved with Catalina and to pour my heart and soul into it. And it's so magical, I and mean, the air feels different. I don't know why, it just takes over you. Mr. Wrigley, although he had all of this money, was really a very common man. He was stated many times to have said that he wanted everyone to be able to come over and enjoy this island. He did so much to build up Avalon. Instead of running tent hotels, he wanted to build beautiful hotels. He decided he should buy glass bottom boats to see the undersea gardens. He put in electricity and water. Water was a big problem on Catalina. And it's kind of funny to think about that now because water is still a big problem on Catalina. Mr. Wrigley realized that there are only three loves that he really had in his life. It was his family number one, it was the island number two, and it was the Cubs number three. He thought a good way to promote Catalina was to bring a different kind of star. So he moved spring training for the Cubs to Catalina. It's kind of hard to imagine now, but this was Wrigley Field once. This is where the Cubs practiced on Catalina from 1921 to 1951. If you know where to look, you can still see some of the remnants, maybe still hear some of the sounds and feel some of the magic from those days. Just watching the Cubs and just, just the excitement they brought to Avalon. Want, you wanted to be there. You wanted to be there with those guys. They met us at the boat. The gals put the lays around our shoulders, and we came down. We bowled. We played horseshoes. We talked. It was just like we were part of this family. There's another thing so they thought would attract people to Catalina was to make movies here, and so he did promote this as a place for producers. Anything you ever see that's a South Sea movie that's black and white was undoubtedly filmed here. The bison were brought over to film Zane Gray's novel, A Vanishing American. Fortunately, the bison didn't really stick to the script, and they kind of scattered in all different directions. The bison ended up repopulating and ultimately got to about 700. So they tried to keep the number around 200 to 250. There were all kinds of stars that were here. When I was a kid, John Wayne was here a lot. Uh, by the way, Marilyn Monroe we used to party with some of our younger kids here in Avalon. When she was 16, Norma Jane Doherty got married and she married a merchant marine. He was stationed out here during the war, and so she was a, a resident in Avalon in Catalina before she was Marilyn Monroe. He blasted the rock away so that he could build his bigger dance pavilion, which he called casino, meaning meeting place in uh, Italian, which has been a source of great confusion ever since because people think you can gamble there. 
We're in the Avalon Theater area of the casino building, and it was one of the first theaters built for sound. One time my mother told me she was here. When the lights went up, she was sitting next to James Cagney. and didn't know it while they were watching the movie. The largest number that they ever had for a big band was during Memorial Weekend of 1934. We had 10,000 people standing and dancing here in this beautiful ballroom. I'm told that one of the disagreements he had along the way was with his lieutenants in the Santa Catalina Island Company where they wanted to charge for people to come and dance and he insisted that it be free, that it was something that should be enjoyed by everybody regardless of their station in life. When William Wrigley died in 1932, the whole aura of Santa Catalina Island dimmed. He was so much a part of the spirit of Catalina in its glory days of the 1920s and 30s. There was bound to be a hangover and Catalina began to suffer. America goes to war. The war was declared on December 7th, 1941. On December 8th, the government Right away, they had plans for this island. The only way you could go back and forth was to show a card. You had to either be with the military or you had to be a resident on the island. No visitors were allowed here during World War II. So the economy really plummeted. A lot of the families left the island. The Chicago Cubs, who had been coming here from 1921, had to stop during the war because a lot of their players had been drafted. The interesting thing is when the Cubs left after 1951, a lot of the locals thought they were coming back because just a few years earlier during the war they had left and they thought, well, this will be a short-term thing and over time they realized they weren't coming back anymore. I literally grew up in the city of Chicago, so for me, Catalina was paradise. I love horses and my father loved horses, so my fondest memories are, are riding with him in the mountains. I love it when people say, I've been to Catalina, I've been to Avalon, and I bought a t-shirt. There's so much more to Catalina than just Avalon. It's all hidden in the valleys and on the mountains, and there's so many plants and animals to see that are you know, really exciting and really different that you don't find anywhere. There's no question that Farnsworth Bank is probably one of the greatest dives you can do in the world. In 1975, my grandfather, Philip K. Wrigley, and his sister, Dorothy Offield, deeded 88% of Catalina's land to the Conservancy so that you have the wild lands of Catalina being available for people who are just 22 miles away in an urban setting, and they can come here and be in a whole different universe. In order to show everyone the beauty of the island, you have to be able to do that without damaging the island at the same time. So it's definitely an ongoing challenge. With these wonderful legacies of three generations of Wrigley's, the responsibility has been placed on my wife and to some extent my shoulders to help move the island forward even more. Businesses on Catalina Island don't have enough water. You're still asking guests not to take a bath. No baths, please. I don't know what we're going to do. 50% seems like a lot. Let's see. Uh, three people in a shower at once, <laughs> drink soda and beer instead of water, I don't know. We used to have a thousand people here year round, now we got 4,000 people. People are starting to bring water over from the mainland, but then you get problems with the, the people on the mainland being mad that we're stealing their water there, so uh, water is always going to be an issue. We're going to have to start making a few major modifications on how we perceive even life over here on the island. Catalina now has to go up to bat and we have to have a little more ammo than just simply to say that we're a place that's stood still for the last 50 years. We've been working on things like our Descanso Beach Club, the zip line. <laughs> the ultimate Catalina thrill ride was coming down these hills in a stagecoach and now we have a zip line. Same sort of idea, probably a little safer. That's one thing my kids have learned from being zip line guys. They're trained naturalists trained by the Conservancy, and it's an eco-tour. But getting a new perspective really changed my view of Catalina and made me realize how important it is to me and how uh, I, could, I could never let Catalina not be a part of my life. Well, our vision really is to maintain the history 
honor it, but to bring it into modern times. I think each generation has the past and what's gone on, and then they add something of their own. We seem to be the, the building generation, I think because everything that my great-grandfather built is now very old and it needs maintenance all at the same time, so that's a, a big challenge. People don't want development, they want it as it always has been. There are certain things we should preserve, other things that uh, it, it's good to upgrade them. Places like the casino are incredible jewels. This is all the original wood that you would have danced on on May 29th, 1929. And we can't just let them fall into the ocean. I always consider this to be a living thing. I refer to it as a her. This is a woman, uh, an older woman, but a very proud and a beautiful woman. When the old lady's happy, everybody's happy. Something that I realized just the other day is that at the time that William Wrigley Jr. became involved with Catalina, he was 58 years old. Then he was still going like crazy. I just feel the same kind of energy, and I know Jeff does too, and you know, hopefully we live as long as he did and are able to accomplish more than we have to date. After 15 and a half hours of swimming, the waterlogged 17-year-old George Young won the $25,000 grand prize. He said he did it for his sick mother. That was fine for him to be the king, my mother to be the queen, but then they coined that Marianne and I were the little princesses, and I was absolutely didn't like that. I did not want to be called a princess. San Miguel Island is the third largest of the eight California Channel Islands. It's often called the birthplace of the winds. The winds can be devastating, gale force winds, 60 mile an hour. It is surrounded by shoals and rock pinnacles and submerged reefs. The rains can be pelting, torrential rains. Very few people, historically, ventured out to San Miguel Island because of the dangers involved in getting there. It's very treacherous with the currents coming in from the Point Conception area. It's the graveyard of ships because of the more than three dozen shipwrecks that are known for that island. As a matter of fact, our house was built from one of those shipwrecks. It takes a particular kind of individual to want to get away there. Both Captain Waters, who was tired of working for someone else and wanted to be his own boss, and Herbie, who uh, felt increasingly oppressed by city life, wanted to have his own turf. Who doesn't? It's the pioneer spirit of America, and it illustrates it. My father was uh, Herbert Stever Lester. He served in World War I. He got badly wounded with shrapnel. He was then sent to Walter Reed Army Hospital, and that's where he met Bob Brooks. I, I don't know whether they were roommates or in a ward or whatever, but they were side by side. They started talking, and Daddy, at some point, had talked about the island. He was fascinated by the fact that Bob Brooks had this ranch out on San Miguel Island. My father always needed somebody to look after the ranch, make sure people didn't steal sheep. And Herbie was an amazingly capable man for a situation like that. He could fix anything, he could chew a horse, he could cheer. He wanted to get out of New York, and, and uh, he was a socialite, I guess, and so he offered him the position. But he said, you got to be married to go out in the island. My mother was Elizabeth Sherman and her father did not believe in women going to college. And at that point, she was ready to become the debutante. And so she had her debutante party in New York City, and that was, of course, very fancy. And in 1930, he asked his bride, Elizabeth, to come with him to live on this idyllic island. Of course, it was beautiful coming into the harbor. It reminded her of Cape Cod. You know, she was in love and... 
It was a big surprise when she first saw the ranch house. It was very stark. Uh, she told me, she said, you know, your dad forgot to tell me a few things about, you know, little niceties. I'm sure she was quite shocked when she got to the island of his description with a house built so that its back broke the winds. There was no electricity, just candlelight and kerosene lamps. It would not be uncommon to see the little mice or the black stink bugs walking along in the bedroom floor. Elizabeth Lester put her New York touches on furniture, windows. She made antimacassars for chairs. And then, of course, my father started hanging all of his rifles. He built a beautiful fireplace to keep us warm. Being in that living room, it was so cozy. We would read stories. We had a battery-powered radio. Uh, we loved listening to Fibber McGee and Molly. Uh, of course, my parents, we always heard the evening news. It was just special. I was in San Miguel Island when a ranch house burned up. I uh, was fishing halibut there, and the Navy was shooting at this target. Back in the days after the ranch closed, the Navy exercised its ownership of the island, and then they started to use the island for bombing and missile testing. One particular group, they were going to land out on the flats, and when the Navy noticed that somebody landed out here, they sent a plane out to chase these folks off the island. And the flare that dropped up here started a fire. The wind was coming up, and it just blew the fire right across the island. And that was the end of the ranch house. OK, the next room here is the killer whale bar, which is right around in here. And in the bar, he decorated the walls with his collection of rifles, one of which was a whale gun. Herb delighted in serving his island guests whiskey at the killer whale bar. I guess there was no zoning back then. You could put the school right next to the bar. That's right. <laughs> the mother would ring that bell every morning at 9 o'clock, and we marched out to school. Well, my mother had all these various things that we were graded on, spelling, arithmetic, your deportment. I'm sure my sister got the higher grace. <laughs> but and I have to be honest, with me, I really wanted to be outside. I loved going down to the beach. There were these caves I could play in. There was a, a beautiful white sandy beach. It was heaven. Bob Brooks did not allow his daughters on San Miguel Island. It was too rough. It was too rugged. He said, no, it's no place for kids. I can't be babysitting you if I'm working. Every year, they had to tear down and build the uh, dock. And my father slipped and fell on this rusty metal object and impaled his uh, right up his. his posterior, I guess it'd be the nice thing to say. I think he had to put a tourniquet type thing on because he would have bled to death. They put him on a sled and dragged him up to the house. And I think they both fortified themselves with a lot of alcohol. He used a wool sack needle. A big four-incher. Herbie sewed up Daddy with a fishing line. They flew the flag upside down, which is a distress signal. And nobody came until 13 days later. Took him to the Cottage Hospital in Santa Barbara. The doctor took one look at this wound and said, this is amazing. I couldn't have done any better myself. No charge. My father was an aviator, and he was looking for places to go. He decides to fly over to the island, circled over there, figured out a place to land. He first landed right in this pasture, and George introduced himself. They immediately struck up a great friendship, and that friendship really uh, grew over the next you know, 10 or 15 years. He also gave them an opportunity to come to the mainland. He would land at his mother's estate. It was called Bonnie Mead, and, and that was so special to get 
to fly in his plane rather than take a fishing boat over in rough, rough water and get seasick. So when the family came to town, it was not only a big deal for the family, but for reporters wanting to look at these people to see if they looked different. Were they wild children? What types of children were these that were growing up on this isolated island? Well, Life magazine dubbed us having the smallest schoolhouse in the world and uh, called us Swiss family Lester. News photographers would follow us up and down State Street. We got to go to the toy store, and I was really awed by all these different things you could look at. And I thought you could just take and my mother had to sort of, in a kind way, explain to me that you don't just take them out of those stores, you gotta pay for them. <laughs> when Herbert Lester managed San Miguel Island, it became his life. It became something that made him feel larger than life. And he called himself the king of San Miguel Island. He was the king of his own 10,000 acre empire. And it was an incredible Robinson Crusoe type story for the Lester family. And it was the most wonderful life over here. And I'm just so sorry that we had to leave so abruptly. As World War II geared up and the military started increasing its presence, things took a dramatic turn. The Navy boys were uh, about 18 or 19 or 20 years old. They were very young. And he was king of the island, and they kind of ridiculed him. My dad, really, with all his guns that he had, he felt he could certainly take care of the island himself. Shortly after that, my father suffered a very serious hand accident. I'm not a psychiatrist, but I see him and portray him as manic depressive. And inevitably, he had his, uh, his crash when World War II came along and he was threatened with eviction from the place that was his soul and his heart. Mr. Brooks asked if I would like to go to the island. And so we headed out. I was sicker than hell on that boat. I was a weak puppy when we got off shore. And that was the night that we had to go hunt for Herbie. He knew that the boat was expected that day, and he would have gone down to meet the boat when the whistle blew. And when we got there, why, there was uh, nobody to meet us. Herbie wasn't around. My mother later thought things over, and she went to the safe, because that's where all the, our important letters were kept. And she found it. When I woke up the next morning, I could tell something horrible had happened, just seeing my mother in the kitchen. He waited until he saw the ship coming in and Bob Brooks was aboard, because he knew that Mr. Brooks would take care of everything. But he feared he was going blind due to the effects of the sulfur drug they had given him to ward off infection, compounded by his fear that we might have to move from the island, I believe, led to him choosing to end his own life. When my father died, I was totally shattered by that. I was extremely close to him. In the letter he wrote, how he loved us. And I personally feel he knew we eventually would be okay, we would leave the island, and he, he was a very unselfish man. It was terribly tragic, and it was a very difficult time for the Lester family. But I can say in hindsight that the years that Betsy Lester spent on San Miguel Island shaped her future. I wouldn't have traded my nine years for anything else. I felt I was very fortunate to have this opportunity. These are the words from my mother's book he created a life and a world for himself and for us on San Miguel. It is all buried as he is buried out there, but not alone. Now that I am an old woman, I am glad I had the privilege of sharing it all. 
for in his imagination we dwelt on our island paradise, the king and the queen, and the two little princesses. We are all still there in spirit for those who seek us, those who have the skill to dream of what it must have been.